Hello everyone. Today's lecture uh, covers the topic of measurement. We'll start out by discussing first the International System of Measurement or the SI system. Commonly this is known as the metric system. The first question is why do we use the SI system in science? Why not use the familiar English measurements that most of us in the United States use more frequently? Well the answer to this uh, is there are a number of things that are needing to be considered. First of all, the SI system, the metric system, is a power of 10 system. This greatly simplifies any of the calculations that we need to make in using the metric system. Also, we have universal use by scientists world, worldwide of the metric system. This is really important because it establishes common language for all scientists. To illustrate the importance of this, I always remember the story of the Mars Climate Orbiter which crashed in September 1999. This was a multi-million dollar mission which ultimately failed because of a miscommunication. What happened was NASA had partnered with Lockheed Martin to plan the, uh, the mission of this spacecraft. Lockheed Martin, when they were programming the flight plan, actually was working with English units, pounds, feet, are examples of English units. The numbers that they sent to NASA, NASA interpreted as being metric measurements. Uh, for example, meters, newtons. Uh, because of this miscommunication, the spacecraft trajectory uh, with which it was approaching Mars was incorrect and, and caused the mission to fail and the spacecraft to basically burn up as it entered into the Martian atmosphere. SI base units. The number of base units that you, are, that you need to be familiar with. The first of which uh, for mass is the kilogram. We abbreviate this kg. Length is the meter, m. Time is second, s. Temperature is Kelvin, k. Uh, very frequently we also use degrees Celsius. And then for the amount of substance we do use the mole in chemistry. Uh, you may be wondering about kilogram. Why isn't the gram the SI base unit? Uh, the kilogram is actually the base unit because this is the re only remaining SI unit which is defined by a physical object. It is a platinum iridium uh, alloy a cylinder which is kept in France. Derived units. These are units that are going to be derived, that are going to be the result of mathematical computations. Some examples are volume, area, density. Uh, we can see that these are the result of calculations. Volume, length times width times height area, length times width. Density would be mass divided by volume. Another example would be speed. For example, miles per hour or meters per second. The SI prefixes that you'll need to know, these are all multiples of 10. You will need to know mega, m, kilo, k, centi, c, milli, m, micro, the symbol is called mu, and nano is a lowercase n. Uh, these again are the metric prefixes that you should memorize. Mega means one million, kilo means one thousand, centi means one one hundredth, milli means one one thousandth, micro is one one millionth, and nano means one one billionth. Uh, giving examples of some objects that are one prefix meter long. So an object that is one megameter long is the distance from San Diego to El Paso. An object uh, or something which is one kilometer long, if we were to do two and a half laps around the high school track, that would be 1,000 meters or one kilometer. One centimeter, the length of a fingernail. One millimeter, the thickness of a seed, for example, a sesame seed. Uh, one micrometer, the length of a bacterial cell would be measured on this scale. And finally, one nanometer, the length of a glucose molecule is approximately one nanometer. Describing your observations, we have two different types of data that we collect in science. The first of which is qualitative. This deals with qualities or characteristics of an object that we are gathering information about by using our senses. Examples of qualitative measurements could be color, odor, um, texture would all be examples of qualitative data pieces. Quantitative deals with quantities or numbers. These are measurements. For example, length measured in meters, mass measured in grams or kilograms. 
Additional information about measurements. It's really important to understand the difference between accuracy and precision. Uh, very often in everyday language we use these terms interchangeably, but for use in science there really are two different meanings for these terms. Accuracy, an accurate measurement, means that we have a measurement close to the real value. If we have a person who weighs 175 pounds, if we were to have them step on, onto a scale and that scale measured 175, that scale is providing an accurate measure of that person's weight. If we have them step onto a different scale and it measures 174, again, this is an accurate measure of that person's weight. If they step onto a third scale and it measures 155, this is not an accurate measurement. Precision means that... Let's continue by discussing precision. Precision means that measurements, multiple measurements, are all close together. That the device being used to make the measurements is giving reproducible results. So again, an individual who weighs 175 pounds, we're measuring their weight many times using the same scale. If they step up onto the scale one time and it measures 175, they step up onto the scale another time it measures 174, another time it measures 175 again, a fourth time it measures 176. This scale is giving very precise measurements because it is um, always giving a measurement close to the real value. Uh, now, we would also say that those measurements were all accurate. Uh, if an individual stepped up onto the scale and it measured 150, and then 165, and then 142, and then 189, uh, here we would say that those measurements are not precise because they're bouncing all over the place. Uh, it is possible sometimes to have a measurement tool that we use which does not have good precision but may yield accurate results. And I'd like everyone to think about that and be prepared to discuss that in class discussion. Calculating your accuracy in lab. Uh, we use a couple different things to calculate accuracy in lab. One is percent yield. This is when we would be looking at, uh, for example, an experiment where we're producing a product and we would experimentally figure out how much have we yielded in a reaction, how much did we produce. Uh, we would divide this by a theoretical yield, the amount we should have been able to make. The experimental divided by theoretical multiplied by 100 would give us a percent yield. Percent error is a little bit different. Percent error would be our experimental yield in lab minus the theoretical yield divided by the, the theoretical yield multiplied by 100. Uh, this is going to give us the percent error. An analogy here, Percent yield is like the percent correct you score on a quiz or a test. Percent error is like the percent wrong that you got on that quiz or a test. Please do not use absolute value for calculating percent error. Some websites and some books will show it done in this manner, but in chemistry we don't want to do this because we have the ability to calculate either negative or positive percent errors. A negative percent error would mean our experimental value is lower than the theoretical result. A positive percent error would mean that our experimental value is actually over the theoretical yield. Significant digits. A significant digit is one which is actually measured. Uh, the number of significant digits in a measurement is going to depend on the, uh, the measuring device that we are using. We will be discussing the bathroom scale example in class. It's too long to put into this presentation. We need to understand which numbers are exact and which ones are estimated. All measurements will include a um, number of digits which are exact plus one additional digit which is estimated. Again, this will be part of our class discussion. Rules to determine significant figures. If we're only looking at numbers that are written down, all non-zero digits are going to be considered significant. You'll notice in the number 120.40, I've underlined the 1, the 2, and the 4. These are significant digits in that measurement. Now we need to discuss what happens with zeros. Let's continue. Zeros between non-zero digits are going to be significant. The underlined zero in the second line between the two and the four is a significant digit. Uh, the device which gives us the measurement 120.40 could also give us a measurement of 121.40. Zeros that are in front of non-zero digits are not significant. The number 0 0.000045 has only two significant figures. All those zeros preceding the four are simply placeholders. The end of number zeros to the right of a decimal are going to be significant in a measurement. 
uh, 120.40, the underlined zero here after the four to the right of the four is a significant digit. The device that gives us the measurement 120.40 could give a measurement of 120.41. So we do need to consider that that zero is significant. If we have end of number zeros, but there is no decimal shown in the number, those are not considered to be significant. The number 1,200, the way it is shown in this presentation, has only two sig figs. Finally, zeros between significant figures are also going to be significant. So 100.0, the point zero, the final zero, is significant because it comes to the right of the decimal. The zeros that are underlined here, which are in between there, are significant because they fall between the one and the significant zero after the decimal. Math rules with sig figs. Addition and subtraction, we will keep the last full column as significant for the answer. When we plug 4.34 plus 2.00123 into our calculator, we find an answer of 6.34123. Now that's not the final answer that we're going to report. We need to understand that both of these numbers are significant to the hundredths column. Now the second number is significant beyond that. That doesn't matter because 4.34 is only significant to the hundredths column. So we would round off our answer to 6.34. Multiplication and division, we will keep the least number of significant figures for the answer. 3.23 divided by 0 0.8765 will give us a result of 3.68511238 when we plug that into our calculator. However, 3.23 has three sig figs. The number 0 0.8765 has four sig figs. Our answer should only be reported to have three sig figs. So we would report an answer of 3.69. We do need to round our result to get that. Uh, we are going to follow normal rules for rounding. We do have one special rule in chemistry. It's called the round to the even rule. We will be discussing this in class. To preview, 3.15 and 3.25 are both going to round to 3.2. I'd like for you to try to come up with ideas about why you would want to have this rule for rounding. I'll give you a hint. It does have to do with statistics. Scientific notation. Uh, we also use scientific notation in chemistry. There's three different reasons why we would use scientific notation. The first of which would be to show the correct number of significant figures in a number. So if we have the number 510, as it's written there, 510, is really only two sig figs. But what if we need to record the number 510 to mean that there are three sig figs? We can do this by writing it out in scientific notation. 5.10, we're moving the zero now to come after the decimal, which makes it significant. Uh, but we have to multiply that times 10 to the 2. Um, so we have 5.10 times 10 to the 2. All numbers for scientific notation need to be at least 1. They need to be less than 10. So we wouldn't want to write this as 51.0 times 10 to the 1. Uh, that's not how scientific notation works. The second number, uh, 6, 000, we can write this as 6.1 times 10 to the 9. Uh, this is for very, very large numbers. Um, and we can see here that we have um, a large number, positive exponent. I'm moving my decimal. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, eight, nine spots to get times 10 to the 9. Uh, or we may use scientific notation to show very small numbers. The number here, 0 0.00000061, can be written more easily as 6.1 times 10 to the negative 9. Again, a very small number means we will have a negative exponent. How do we figure out what that is? We just count how many places we move the decimal. So we're moving the decimal 1, 2, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right. Well, that is the end of our presentation on measurement. Again, we will have some additional class discussions relating to some of these topics, including the bathroom scale example, the round to the even rule example. Uh, so thank you again, and I will see you next time.